In previous videos, we covered the basic principles of carbon footprinting. Now, you'll apply these principles to calculate the carbon footprint of a Taslandian organisation. Here, we'll work through a complete example, which will also introduce you to the interface for Carbon 101X's Carbon Footprint Practical Tool. Our example company comes from the snowy alpine region of Tasland, where winter sports are very popular. The Swanson Mountains Management Group, we'll call them Swanson Group for short, provides utilities and public infrastructure to patrons and businesses in the Swanson Alpine Village. Our first step in the carbon footprint process is to decide the most appropriate reporting time frame. Depending on the specific organisation, this is commonly either a calendar year or a financial year. However, it can be something completely different. For example, Swanson Group, like many other Alpine resort businesses, conducts all annual reviews based on their operating year, which runs from the beginning of the ski season on the 1st of December and ends on the 30th of November. So, from the following list of options, which reporting period should Swanson Group choose? Well, to align with the organisation's financial reporting and operating year, the answer should be the third option, 1st of December 2015 to the 30th of November 2016. In the Carbon 101X Carbon Footprint Practical, you'll be given feedback on your responses. You'll have three attempts for each question. After your final attempt, click the Show Feedback button to see an explanation of the correct answer. The next step is to define the organisational boundary. This requires making decisions about which facilities and assets, such as buildings and vehicles, to include in Swanson Group's carbon footprint. In order to do this, it's essential to understand the organisation's business activities and assets. Swanson Group provides the following services in the Alpine Village. Utilities, including water and sewerage treatment, and public infrastructure including car parks, trail maintenance and snow clearing. To support the delivery of these services, the company owns and operates a fleet of cars, snowplows and snowmobiles, a wastewater treatment plant and an office building in the Alpine Village. Swanson Group also leases a block of self-contained units for permanent staff accommodation, which are owned and maintained by Azure Property. Now, which assets should we include in Swanson Group's carbon footprint? There are different approaches for deciding this, but for most companies, the criterion of operational control is recommended. This means that Swanson Group should include all assets where it has the authority to make changes to processes and equipment that result in an increase or decrease in emissions. In the Carbon 101X Practical, you will use the drag and drop tool to categorise the different facilities and assets as either within the organisational boundary or not applicable. Most of Swanson Group's assets are straightforward. If they are owned and operated by the company, it's safe to assume that Swanson Group has operational control over them. However, the permanent staff accommodation requires more careful consideration. We know that the Swanson Group doesn't own the self-contained units. Instead, it leases them from another company. But that's not enough information. We need to determine who has operational control over the asset. Swanson Group, the lessee, or Azure Property, the owner. Well, our example scenario states that Azure Property is also responsible for the maintenance of the units. This means that Swanson Group has very little authority to implement its own operating policies or make changes to this asset. Therefore, we should not include the accommodation units in Swanson Group's carbon footprint. Next, it's time to identify all the emission sources within the organisation's business activities. In the Carbon 101X Practical, you will be presented with a list of potential emission sources for your chosen company, like we can see here for Swanson Group. Your job is to classify them as either Scope 1, Scope 2 or Scope 3. Remember, Scope 1 includes all emissions that occur within the organisational boundary 
as a direct result of a particular activity. For example, Swanson Group's Scope 1 emission sources include diesel fuel, which is used in the vehicle fleet, and fugitive refrigerant gas, which leaks out of the office air conditioning units. Scope 2 means indirect emissions from purchased electricity, heat and steam. Scope 3 includes all other indirect emissions from upstream or downstream the organisation's value chain. For example, in its Scope 3 emissions, Swanson Group could include upstream emissions from the manufacturing of paper used in the company's office and corporate air travel by management staff. In both of these cases, the emissions occur outside Swanson Group's organisational boundary as an indirect consequence of the company's activities. Now we're getting to the most critical part of the carbon footprinting activity, calculating the company's greenhouse gas emissions. This requires you to first collect activity data for each emission source, such as litres of fuel or kilowatt hours of electricity used. In Carbon 101X, you're given this data. You just need to input the values into the correct field in the calculation table. Next, you need to identify which emissions factors to use in order to convert your activity data into an emissions estimate. Emissions factors are usually issued by governments or international bodies such as the World Resources Institute. In the Carbon 101X practical, you can look these up in the expandable tables under Step 2 of the calculation activity. Let's consider electricity as an example. Under the electricity table, we can see several different countries listed, each with a unique emissions factor. For the Swanson Group, we'll scan straight down the table for Tasland. Here, we can see that the emissions factor for Tasland's grid electricity is 0.5793 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. So, we'll input that value into our calculation table using the emissions factor drop down menu. Ultimately, once we know how many kilowatt hours of electricity has been used, we can multiply that number by the electricity emissions factor. You'll notice that some sources, such as diesel, have three emissions factors one under CO2, one under CH4, and one under N2O with all three expressed as carbon dioxide equivalents. This is so organisations have the option of analysing the specific contribution of the main greenhouse gases to their carbon footprint. We're not going to cover that extended analysis in this practical activity, but you can still input the values for each greenhouse gas in the calculation table. Whew. So that's emissions factors. But what about that other column in the table? the energy content factor. Well, sometimes fuel data will be in a different unit to the emissions factors and need to be converted into a compatible unit before the emissions factors can be applied. For example, we know that Swanson Group used 80,000 litres of diesel throughout the year. But in the table, we can see that the emissions factors for liquid fuels are expressed in kilograms of CO2e per gigajoule. Therefore, in order to be able to apply the emissions factors, we first need to convert this fuel unit from volume, that is litres, to energy, or gigajoules. We can do this using the energy content factor, indicated in the second column of the emissions factor table, which specifies the amount of energy contained within a given volume of fuel. This extra step is commonly required when calculating emissions for liquid fuels and is also sometimes necessary when working with other fuels such as coal and natural gas. And now the final step in calculating the emissions from each source. Multiply the activity data by the emissions factors. There are some small differences in the calculation formulas for different sources, so be sure to select the correct one. Once we click Submit, a complete carbon footprint is calculated for our company. Now that we've finished our example, it's your turn to compile a carbon footprint for another Taslandian company. 
If you get stuck, don't forget to visit the Carbon 101X discussion board and read the Five Common Mistakes article, which can be found below the Carbon Footprinting Practical. Good luck!